Jeremiah chapter 3, and I'm going to look at verses 4 and 5. There's something greater than success. Can I just talk a minute? I've been blessed to be all over America, and different regions value different things. The West Coast in particular, and I would say even more so, we being the tech capital of the whole world. Not of this region, not of this state, but the whole world. Uh, Success is valued highly here. But then even successful people find themselves empty. Because which accomplishment is going to finally be the one that satisfies? There's something greater than success. Listen to this and take it home. It's called significance. Because I believe you can amass a lot of stuff but live your life virtually insignificant. Meaning you have been able to accumulate things but you haven't left your print on anybody's life. And for Ron Carpenter, a life well spent is when people walk away from me and in some way or another, I have affected and altered their life in a positive way. To me, that's successful. It's just not stuff. I believe if you bless and alter people's life, stuff will follow. Because a lot of times, the greatest success comes with the way you help people the most. Okay? You know why in and out so successful? Because they helped me with my hunger problem. <laughs> and people that find a problem and they feel it. Let me tell you something. Ah, here I go. Always listen to people's complaints. Because people's complaints are an opportunity. Whenever people in the church complain, I know there's an opportunity for ministry. Because complaints arrive out of a deficit. And the people that have been significant in life is they hear the cry of the deficit of the people and they formulate a way to meet that need. So don't run from complaints. Listen to complaints because they'll show you what's missing. And when you can be the missing piece, then your life is all of a sudden taking on a totally different meaning. Is this all right what I'm talking to you about here? Okay. So I'm going to talk about on assignment, but I've got to get into some stuff this Sunday and next before I get into the more wisdom-oriented stuff on how to live life on assignment. A poll was taken and over 70% of people in America said that they lived their life with a sense of being deeply unsatisfied. Deeply unsatisfied. Seven out of 10 people you meet So we've learned how to smile and let people know everything's all right, but it's just not true. And so we've gotten stuff and people are still deeply unsatisfied. What's the missing piece? When you get up every day of your life and you know you're living life on assignment, everything changes. So Lord, help me to communicate well today and give us ears to hear in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. Jeremiah chapter 1, the Lord, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah is a prophet, Old Testament prophet. They're called major prophets and minor prophets, uh, not because one of them is more important than the other, but Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, these are large prophetic books. We call them the major prophets because of the size of the prophetic literature. Then you go to the smaller ones, okay? You got Nahum, Habakkuk, Obadiah, some of them are a page long. We call them the minor prophets. This right here is a very popular passage of scripture, but instead of just quoting it, I'm gonna break it down. Somebody say break it down, all right? Do y'all have any amens left in you? I need some talk back today, okay. The word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you, look, formed, sanctified and ordained before I got here. Before I ever showed up on the birthing table. One of the greatest debates in our country is when does life begin? And all of them's wrong. Republicans and Democrats. It begins in heaven. 
You didn't show up here because your mom had a one night stand and didn't even like the guy and you feel like you have no purpose because let me tell you something, you didn't show up and God said, oh, I got to get something going for this gal. She ain't got nothing going for her. Life did not begin with that. Life began in heaven. And it really don't matter how you got into the earth. It matters that you're here. Some of us get hung up on why, how we got here. Doesn't matter how you got here. The fact is life began in heaven and God had to get you here. Okay? Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. I'm going to tell I'm going to really hone in on several of these words right here. When you talk about assignment, you have to go through, you have to go through the introspection of where am I different? Where am I different? Okay, I am not mad at my eyes because they don't hear. I am not put out with my ears because they don't see. I have a writing pen over here that I scratch notes on a post-it note and my pen cannot do what my glasses do. And I'm not mad at it. My glasses cannot do what my pen does. I am not upset that I went to In-N-Out Burger and they didn't serve lobster. I didn't get mad at the steakhouse because there were no enchiladas on the menu. And success and assignment comes with the realization not of where you blend, but where you're different. And let me tell you something. God does not need anybody else's permission for you to embrace your difference. And some of you are waiting for other people to embrace it and God's waiting for you to embrace it yourself. Because if all you have is heaven's agreement, you got all the agreement you need. Before I get into breaking down this scripture, I wanna take about three minutes and just tell you my own personal little mess up, my own little story. Um, you know, I read all the statistics when I came here. Like I said, in the Southeast where I had spent my entire adult life, my entire ministry, there's more Christians than there are people. <laughs> you know, the first thing you ask somebody is their name, where I come from. Second thing you ask them is where to go to church. So I read all the statistics about the Bay Area. It's the opposite. It's the most unchurched region in America, 97% unchurched, and the 3% that go, they say, are Catholic. So they say there's just not many like us. I read all that. So I knew coming here, that means we're gonna do a lot of evangelism, we're gonna get a lot of people saved. So I've always been known, if you will, let me tell you my difference. I've always been known as a preacher just being a gunslinger. I can't come up here and just have a talk. That's fine, all those guys that do it and do it well and they walk around and do this and they have the little ear mic and, and they just are great communicators. Great, I appreciate all them guys. If I did that, I would be the biggest jack leg fake you've ever seen in your life. That ain't me. They tried to get me in my homiletics class to learn how to preach with a manuscript and write down every word and make eye contact and read my manuscript and look back up while I'm flipping the page. I made a D in homiletics. I could not write a manuscript and I cannot do the eye contact and the flip. I can't do it. And for a while, I felt like a failure. Why? Because in that setting, in that Bible school setting, they tried to get me to blend. I don't like to preach on a stage. You know why? Because I don't like there to be distance between me and the people. And it makes for horrible TV. And everybody calls us and says, man, get back up on the stage. Your camera angles are terrible. I said, you know what? I can't bend myself around a camera angle. I got to bend the camera angle around what I do best. I've got to embrace who I am. We'll just deal with the camera angles, but I got to be down here where I can spit on somebody. And so I'll be honest with you, I've, I've been known as, man, that guy will say anything. 
I used to have people say, man, I come to your church just to see you set yourself on fire and burn. You're crazy. And that's who I always was. And I embraced that. I found myself. And that's who I am. I am passionate. I love the word of God. I love to preach. I love people. I love church. I'm not tired. I'm not burnt out. I can't wait to get here. I got here at 6 o'clock this morning. I was waiting on you to show up. I've been praying. I've been drinking co- two pots of coffee. And I am wired up. And I'm believing God's going to do something great. And you got to understand, that's the way I approach what I do. Can somebody shout amen? Tell your neighbor, I don't mind if my pastor's crazy. But I promised you I was going to give you my little hiccup. But when I came here, I said, you know what? I might better dial it back a little bit. Because I had all these pastors text me and said, that won't work out there, pastor. I had one of my greatest mentors tell me, said, you know what? You get away with all kinds of stuff back there, but when you go out to California, it's going to be a little bit different. And so I admit when I struggled some because I didn't want to come out here and lose my identity and not be true to what I am. But at the same time, I didn't want to be stupid and go out here and everybody says, who is this nut who has come across the nation and moved out here? And so I think for a little while I struggled. And then there was about the first of the year, about five months ago, I really went to God over this struggle. And God said, I never told you to dial it back. God said, you made that decision. I didn't tell you to make that decision. He said, now turn it loose and see what I'll do. And every, look at this building. Every Sunday, there's more people in this building than there was the Sunday before. Because I didn't come here to blend. I didn't come here to be like every other church. I came here to find all the other crazy, passionate Christians who want to serve God with all their heart, all their mind, all their soul, and all their strength and rally us together. Let's pray a hole through the sky and do something in this area that's never been done before. Can you embrace your difference today? I need to hear you say amen. Can you embrace that you're not like everybody else? Somebody take 10 seconds and give the Lord your God praise. Hallelujah in this place. Hallelujah. Say it again. Say hallelujah. One more time. Say hallelujah. Yeah. Ah. Hallelujah. Before I formed you. Formed. Actually in the Hebrew there is derived from the process of the potter and the clay. We are made out of the dust of the earth. So God said, before I put you in earth's wheel and spin you and started making you a body, before the male and the female came together biologically. So before you ever had a body, he said, I knew you. The word know, catch this, this is where, it's, it's where this gets a little deep, means to know by experience. Not by, there's knowledge by knowledge and then there's knowledge by experience. Okay? I can stand up here and hold an orange and say it's citrusy, it's sweet, it's acidic, and I can give you a knowledge of it, but until you taste it, the tasting is a whole different thing than me telling you. God said, I didn't tell you about it, I experienced it. So before I put you in the earth in a body, I already knew you by experience. That means I was here before I got here. Oh, I'm sorry. I just see right. I saw about from two rows back. (laughs) The Bible does not go in depth on this subject. I will give you more scriptures of what it says, but there's only about four. 
I had some type of heavenly existence before I showed up in the earth. This is Ron Carpenter. This is not the Bible. I will always tell you the difference between the two. I believe I existed in heaven and I had the kingdom. Because every time Jesus speaks of the kingdom, he speaks as something that's been lost. How can I lose something that was never mine? He says the kingdom is a lost coin. The kingdom is the son that was lost. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. The, the, the king, he's always speaking of the kingdom and something that we formerly had, but we lost. So we had it in heaven, but when we entered the earth, it was lost. Jesus brought it back to earth. My kingdom come and my will be done in the earth as it was in heaven. So when I got here and God formed me, I got here with something missing. Okay? The kingdom is the Holy Spirit coming and living on the inside of me, God taking residence in me, and then me being able and empowered to live out the principles of heaven in the earth. I had that in heaven. But Adam ate from a tree. The tree infected the mind. It was a tree full of knowledge. So when I entered the earth realm and God formed me, I didn't know what I knew there. If, if I said I lost my wallet, my wallet can't be lost if it wasn't mine. My wallet couldn't be lost if I didn't formally possess it. If I said I lost my phone, the phone had to be in my possession. To, the, the presupposition is it was in my possession. That's the only way it could be lost. So when Jesus speaks of the kingdom, always in terms of it being something that got lost, then he's saying, I got to bring you back into the earth what you enjoyed when you were in heaven. Because I knew you in heaven. Woo, hallelujah. He said, I experienced you in heaven. There is a difference, stay with me, between when you were created and when you were made. Am I going too different, too, too hard, or can I stay? There's a difference between you when you were created and when you were made. Okay? Ephesians, Ephesians 1, 4, I think, throw that on the screen. Made means formed. The potter's wheel, the clay. I gave you a body. So God made you, okay? But there's a difference between that and being created. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual... How do you read these scriptures and not unpack them? Uh, no. <laughs> it, yes, sir. That right there, I could preach three months on that. According to that verse right there, you don't have any needs. Well, pastor, you ain't been to my house. According to that scripture, you have no needs. They're just in a different dimension. That's why Jesus went to heaven and sat down. There's nothing left to be done. Everything that you need is already yours. It's just in another realm. You are preaching, pastor. You've been out there doing missionary work and God done jumped on you. You are preaching, pastor. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Where? In heavenly places. In Christ. Next verse. Just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world. That's one of these verses. Before I gave you a body, I had already created you. Before I gave you a body, I had already experienced you. In heaven, you had the kingdom. In the earth, you lost it, and I brought it back so you could live it out in the earth like you did in heaven. Your life was not a random series of events and dead ends and train wrecks, but before you ever got into the earth, I had an ordination, I had a plan. Life began in heaven. It did not begin with your mother and father, and I've got something going on for you. 
And he chose us before the foundations of the world were even laid. Can I go a little bit deeper? Man, my time's getting away from me. Somebody say, preach on, preacher. Somebody say, preach on. <laughs> Hallelujah. By the way, do me one other favor. Look at your neighbor and say, he's talking to you today. He's talking, yeah. Uh, I got so much. Before you were born, the word born is a weird word. It means wound. So before I put you on the potter's wheel and made you a body of clay, I had already experienced you. You were chosen in Christ before the foundations of the world. So God had already put his hand on you, marked you, and set you aside before you showed up. Okay. Now he said, before I wound you, before I took the clay and put it in a womb. Okay. Listen to what he says right here. Before I wound you, he said, then I sanctified you. In the Bible, the word sanctify means to become holy. Church people have made holiness as Getting everything right. You're just a holy roller. Holy does not mean getting everything right. If we could get everything right, we wouldn't need Jesus. Amen. The word holy means separate and other. So, I'm going back. I'm building this thing because you've got to get it for me to do the whole rest of the the, the teaching. Before I put you on the potter's wheel, I already had experiences with you. You had the kingdom. You were chosen in Christ before I ever said, let there be light. Before I put the clay in the womb so it could incubate and be fruitful. Okay? Before I ever did that, I already ordained you and sanctified you, which means I put you in a place where you need to embrace your otherness and your separateness. That is hard to do because most people can't pay the price of being other. The price of being other means alone. And most people will compromise their other to have friends. Because one of the greatest needs in a human is to be accepted. But to be accepted, you have to become like the group you want to be accepted by. That's the only way they accept you. And you compromise your otherness. And you compromise your separateness. I think I'm a really likable guy but I don't have a lot of friends. Why? Because they know I'm different. I can't tell you how many conferences I go to. Listen, I'm not, this ain't a sad story. I'm just telling you, this is the story of my life. I can't tell you how many conferences I go to and there's eight speakers and seven of them stay at the whole, same hotel and they put me in one across town by myself. Because they know. So you know what? It used to hurt my feelings. Now I say it's a compliment yeah. because they recognize I'm not like the other seven guys. I'm different than the other seven guys. If he comes, something different is going to happen than the other seven guys. So I have learned in time. I didn't say I learned it early, but I've learned in time to embrace that. But sometimes that is the trade-off. The trade-off is many times you have, to, you have to compromise what God did that made you so different in order to be accepted by the community you want to be in. But God said, ye are the salt of the earth. And he said, the salt that loses its saltiness is only good for the dung heap. Do I need to tell you what dung is? That's what Jesus said. That's written in red. He, God said, if I put you in the Silicon Valley and I sprinkle you and you're not different enough from it to affect it, you are no good to me. 
He said, if you go there and become it. He said, I didn't reach over here and bring you here for you to become it. I reached over here because I want you to be different from all of it and raise up a people that have been screaming and praying for something different from years. And God said, when you embrace what I've called you to embrace, others are going to hear the call to come up and be a church that says, we don't really care what everybody else thinks about us. We're going to praise like crazy. We're going to worship like crazy. We're going to give like crazy. We're going to serve like crazy. We love our God and we love God's people. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Jesus, I've left about three quarters of this on the plate. I've ordained you. I don't know if I got time to open that. Ephesians 2.10, I'll quit on this one. For we are his workmanship, born in the earth, but created in Christ Jesus. Difference between when you were made and when you were created. Created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works. I'm going to get to that later. That's the assignment part. Which God prepared beforehand. When did he prepare the good works? Before you got here. That you should walk in them. We think that we pray to get God to move. And when I hear that terminology, I want to pull what thin hair I have in my head out. (laughs) I think I shared this here. I don't know where I've shared all my stories before. I was invited one time to a prophetic conference to speak. There were like 12 prophets. My my dominant gift is not prophet. I don't know why I was invited. Here again, they stay at one hotel and I'm across town over here. I don't know why I was there. But I was invited to this prophetic conference to speak. And those guys got up one session after another that day. And if I heard this one time, I heard it 1,500 times that day. God is about to. God is about to. God is about to. God is going to. God is getting ready to. God is this. And God's moving that. And God's shifting this. And God. And I heard that thing all day. So it came, my, I was the night speaker. I got my mic that night. And I said, first of all, God's not about to do anything. <laughs> By the way, I didn't get invited back. <laughs> I said, he's finished. Jesus said, it is, and he went to heaven and he, and your hysteria is not going to get him up. Because you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. That's why he sat down. Praying is not getting God to do something. Praying is moving something from one dimension to another dimension. God has already done everything he's going to do. Now, I know this don't sound deep, but this will change the whole, your whole way of approaching God. This is what is happening when life is moving. It's not that God finally got up out of his laziness and did something for you. It's that God had already laid out your days before you showed up. So you might be about to move into your next day. You might be about to move into the next anointing he has. You might be about to awaken gifts that he's already put in you that have never been awakened. You might be about to open a door that God's had sitting there for 30 years, but you've never opened it. You might be going into a next season, but the season was there before you got there. Come on, somebody. By the time the stars got there, everything was already in the heavens to support them. Before the vegetation came out of the ground, everything was there to support it. Before the cattle was there, there was vegetation to support the cattle. And by the time you got here, everything was here waiting on you when you got here. There's nothing that God needs to do for you to 
fulfill purpose and assignment in the earth. It's been waiting on you the whole time. All you got to do is walk in it. I wish somebody take a step. It's waiting on me. God prepared my days. God prepared my steps. And I'm stepping out of the last and stepping into the next. God, I don't need you to move you. I need you to move me. Hallelujah. Somebody clap and give God praise. say this is going to be a good series I can feel it so Morgan we've got them coming down from the sides I want all of our children children being anybody that's non-teenage to come down if your children are smaller and you want to be a parent that is with them that is fine and if you are a te teacher or principal or administrator in a school system. Please come down and Hope and I are gonna lay hands on you. Then we're gonna dismiss them in the center aisle and the teenagers are gonna come down and then somebody wants your parking space real bad. If we make two or three lines, that's it. That's, that's fine. I know everybody. We don't have enough room for everybody to make one line. The praise team is going to come out and just lead in some worship. Hope and I are going to go down the aisle. Listen, we're just, we're just laying on of hands. We're not spending time praying. All we, get, we lay, all we have to do, according to the Bible, is the laying on of hands. We're going to touch them and believe all four of these things are going to happen. Hey, sweetheart. All four of these things are going to happen. See a few more that are coming forward. Let's get down on this side and move our way from right to left. Andrew, Lizzie, take it on. Come on, let's lead them in some worship.
teenagers. Come on down here, junior high teenagers. Let us lay our hands on you. Can you give it up for these guys? It's a different day. They face a lot of pressures. But we're believing we got a blessed generation right here in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Face to the Lord, turn his face toward. 